Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this morning's talk featuring Senator Orrin Hatch. We're very pleased to uh, welcome Senator Hatch, who's the new chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, among other things. Uh, he has been at the American Enterprise Institute many times to talk about the policies for which he is a, a staunch advocate and none more than the cause of free trade, which brings us here together today. He's been a long uh, time advocate of minimizing trade barriers. Why? Uh, not just because it brings the United States a great deal of money, not because it brings a great deal of money to people around the world, but because Senator Hatch realizes as a man who has uh, the cause of anti-poverty written on his heart that there has literally been no greater uh, force for destroying world poverty uh, than free trade over the past 30 years. Uh, when we step back from trade, we see more poverty. When we embrace trade, we see less poverty. It is literally that simple. Senator Hatch understands this. This is why he's an advocate. He has worked today uh, for, he has worked a great deal for Trade Promotion Authority, TPA, for trade agreements, and these are some of his topics here today. We're so delighted and honored to welcome him. Please join me in welcoming Senator Orrin Hatch. Well, thank you, Arthur. It's great to be with all of you today, and I hope this will be interesting to you. Sometimes uh, the people up there in the Senate uh, uh, think that trade is not all that interesting, but I happen to think it's great. Uh, I, I just have to say that uh, as a practicing Mormon, I get asked a lot of questions, and uh, <coughs> one day this, uh, I was asked to give the uh, uh, the uh, major speech at the United Presbyterian College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. And the president of the school, who was a Presbyterian minister, got up and he told this story. He said this fellow died, and he went up to St. Peter, and he said, where do I go from here? And Peter said, well, y you have your choice. He said, you can either go to heaven or down below because you're a borderline case. He said, of course, I know which one you're going to take. And the man said, well, uh, how about telling me the differences between the two? And he said, well, heaven, he said, that's a land of smooth flowing brooklets and streams and green forests and green pasture land and good companionship and everything. He said, hell, all that is is one old hot, vast, dry desert. And, and the uh, fellow said, well, I kind of like the heat. And Peter thought, oh, gosh. So on the way down to gates of hell, Peter explained the differences again. And finally, uh, the guy relentlessly wanted to go there. So he gets down the gate to hell, and he said, look, fella, he said, the, the joke's gone far enough. He said, heaven's a land of smooth flowing brooklands and streams and green forests and green pasture land and good companionship and everything. All this place is is one old hot, vast, dry desert. And the man said, well, he said, I, I like the heat. And Peter said, okay, buddy, uh, you got it. So he opens up the gates, he looks in there, and there's smooth, babbling brooklands and streams and green forests and green pasture land. And Peter said, oh, those damn Mormons, they've been irrigating again. <laughs> Utah is the second driest state in the union, I want you all to know. So we've, we've really set this pattern for irrigation all over the world, which sets the stage for, uh, for some of the things we're talking about today. Uh, I appreciate uh, Arthur's leadership of this great organization. He does a terrific job. He's a, a terrific intellect, and uh, I've heard him many times, and I, every time I've gained uh, perspectives and I have learned a lot from him. I really appreciate AEI for giving me a chance to, uh, you know, to just share my thoughts about our nation's trade agenda, where it is today, where I think it should be going in the future. This is an especially exciting time to be discussing U.S. trade policy. With two of the most uh, ambitious trade agreements in our nation's history, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, or TPP, and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP. Under active negotiation, the U.S. trade agenda is truly at the precipice of opportunity. The only question is whether the administration and both parties in Congress can work together to seize this opportunity. I know that these days there are many, pr probably even more in this audience, who view bipartisan in the same way others view winning the lottery. Sure, it'd be nice if it happened, but there's no use waiting around for it. And on many issues, they'd be right. But fortunately, trade is one area where, does, where there does seem to be a broad and increasingly bipartisan uh, consensus to get something done. How refreshing is that? 
Today I want to talk about what we need to do to, gr to, to uh, get these two agreements across the line and what those agreements must look like to gain my active support once they're subjected to Congress or submitted to Congress would be a better word. First, I want to assure all of you that as the new chairman of the Finance Committee, the Senate Finance Committee, my goal is to advance a broad and ambitious trade agenda, including renewing the generalized system of preferences, extending the African Growth and Opportunity Act, passing legislation to enable enactment of miscellaneous tariffs bills, miscellaneous tariffs bills, and reauthorizing our Customs and Border Patrol all of these are priorities for me and for the Finance Committee in this new Congress. Today, however, I want to focus on two things. Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, and how it sets, uh, uh, sets out what TPP and TTIP must achieve in order to gain my active support and the active support of others. Last year, I, along with the two former chairmen, Max Baucus and Dave Camp, introduced the Bipartisan Congressional Trade Priorities Act of 2014. Our bill would have renewed TPA and it outlined the objectives of our trade negotiators, uh, negotiators the objectives they should meet in order uh, for a final agreement to be approved by our Congress. That bill, in my opinion, represents the best starting point for our efforts in the Congress. So much of my comments today will be focused on the substance of that legislation. As many of you know, I am currently working with ranking member uh, Ronald Wigan, Wyden and House Ways and Means Chairman uh, Paul Ryan to introduce TPA for this Congress. While there may be some changes, I think the fundamentals we, we will be discussing today will be substantially the same. Let's start by discussing some of the principles that guided our efforts last year as we worked on this to try and bring it into some sort of fruition. In developing the 2014 bill, I had several major objectives in mind. First, I wanted to preserve the fundamental principles of U.S. trade and economic policy that have enabled our country to grow and thrive over the past century. Second, I wanted to make sure uh, we recognized and addressed new opportunities and challenges that our job restorers and creators uh, and workers face when doing business around the globe. And finally, I wanted to rebalance the relationship between Congress and the executive branch when negotiating, implementing, and enforcing international norms and rules, or international trade agreements. These continue to be my main objectives as I work with colleagues on new TPA legislation in the 114th Congress. To provide more detail, let's delve a little deeper into each of these objectives. Objective number one is preserving the fundamental principles of U.S. trade and economic policy. With our bill, the first fundamental principle I sought to preserve was strong intellectual property rights and strong intellectual property rights protection. Intellectual property is the backbone of our economy. It affects large and small companies across America. In my home state of Utah, for example, half a million jobs and 67% of our exports are connected to intellectual property. And that's true of many other states too, or should I say a number of other states. Unfortunately, intellectual property protections around the globe are continually at risk. The U.S. government, it seems to me, has an obligation to ensure that the creative capital of our artists and innovators is protected. This is a long-standing principle. In fact, our founding fathers believed intellectual property, be, property to be so fundamental to America's future prosperity that they explicitly granted Congress the constitutional authority to protect it. Now that's what I wanted to do with uh, our legislation. So I've worked hard to make sure that our 2014 bill maintained the strong intellectual property standards found in the prior 2002 Trade Promotion Authority law. Now this included requiring that trade agreements meet the high standards found in U.S. law, particularly the enforcement obligations. It also included requiring the elimination of price controls and reference uh, pricing, which are used by many countries to deny full market access to innovative pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Our bill then went further within the 2002 law by calling 
for an end to government involvement in intellectual property rights violations, including piracy and cyber theft. This was the first time TPA legislation addressed these particular issues. We also sought to stop foreign government, uh, government uh, theft of trade secrets by including provisions that governments limit the unnecessary collection of trade secret information and protect any information they do collect from disclosure. Our legislation further directed the administration to ensure that regulatory reimbursement regimes that make pricing and reimbursement decisions are transparent, provide procedural fairness, and are non-discriminatory, and provide market access for American goods and, and services, and American products. The bill also called for the elimination of measures that require U.S. companies to locate their intellectual property abroad as a market access or investment condition. Finally, the bill concluded uh, or included an expanded capacity building objective directing the administration to work with U.S. trading partners uh, to strengthen not only their labor laws, as was provided for in 2002, but also their intellectual property right laws. Put simply, for any future trade agreement to win my approval, it needs to meet these standards, and I expect that they will. For TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I fully expect to see intellectual property provisions that are similar to the standards found in U.S. law, resulting in an agreement containing a very high standard of intellectual property rights protection. Now this includes 12 years of regulatory data protection for biologics and strong copyright and trademark protections. Now why do we have 12 years? Because our bio biologic companies are where some of the greatest innovations are going to be found that may alleviate an awful lot of the costs in healthcare over the long run, even though it's very expensive in the short. And these companies uh, go on hope for 10, 15 years and are in the process of producing some of the greatest pharmaceuticals in the history of the world, or biologics. But to do that, they have to have data protection for a, a period of time that is worthwhile. And frankly, uh, we decided, uh, Kennedy and I decided, I had to bra drag him from six years to 12 years. I would have preferred 13 years, and he would have preferred somewhere around eight years. But to his credit, he stuck with me. Uh, and that has become intellectual property law in our country, and I want to see that it is around the world. And if you don't do that, your biologics companies will not be able to compete. They will not be able to stay in business. They will not be able to continue the length of time it takes to develop these life-saving biologics that uh, might make a difference uh, in all of our lives in the future. It's one of the future ways that we very well might be able to alleviate health care costs. So this is important stuff. The intellectual property provisions of TPP also must effectively address the theft of trade secrets and ensure effective implementation and enforcement of IP obligations. In addition, we must ensure that U.S. innovators are able to monetize the fruits of their labor when they export them to other markets. That is why it is critical for TPP to ensure transparency and procedural fairness. In the process by which reimbursement decisions are made regarding medical devices and pharmaceuticals, uh, that's just a, not, a must. Strong intellectual property protections in the context of our TPP negotiations with Europe are also a very big priority. Most European countries already have a high standard of IP protection. And because the US and EU are two of the most innovative economies in the world and successful T, uh, T -tip, any successful TTIP agreement must promote the highest standards of intellectual property protection. In addition, our negotiators must strongly pr promote and protect the interests of our citizens with respect to Europe's approach to geographical indications, the improper use of which impedes our ability to compete uh, not only in Europe, but in many other areas of the world. That's an important thing. As you can properly, properly uh, tell, uh, intellectual property rights are a high priority for me. But they are not the only priority that I have when it comes to trade. 
Another fundamental principle of trade policy that I wanted to protect with our legislation was strong support of services and investment, uh, including maintaining strong investor state dispute settlement provisions. Our 2014 bill sought fair, non-discriminatory treatment for U.S. investors pursuing opportunities overseas. It would have required trade agreements to ensure that U.S. Investors, US investors overseas receive the same basic protections that the United States gives to investors, foreign and domestic, here at home. All of these elements foster stronger legal uh, regimes and more secure economic environments around the world, which is necessary for U.S. businesses to pursue opportunities abroad and to be treated fairly when doing so. Investor state dispute settlement provisions are subject to a lot of overheated and misguided criticism, so let me be clear. The investor state rules I'm talking about simply ensure that other countries adopt and implement the basic fundamental protections that underpin U.S. commercial law, including protection against discrimination, protection against repudiation of contracts, and protection against expropriation without due process and compensation. And because I believe that these uh, policies are the foundation of which American businesses can build opportunities overseas, I will continue to insist that investor state disciplines not be weakened in any of our trade agreements. That means both TPP and TTIP must have strong investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. No trading partners should be given a pass to violate these fundamental legal principles for investors uh, without enforcement. Nor should any U.S. industry, including tobacco, be excluded from receiving these basic pr uh, protections. Now, a third fundamental principle that I sought to maintain in our bill, and the last one I'll talk about today, was real and co comprehensive market access opportunities for U.S. goods and services. This means significant reduction and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and ultimately elimination of tariffs on U.S. exports of goods, services, and agricultural products. Several countries who are partisans to TPP are resisting our efforts to open agricultural mar markets, including Japan and, oddly enough, Canada. Let me be clear. If Japan, Canada, and our other TPP partners are not willing to open their markets to our exports, the final agreement will never receive the support it has to have in Congress. In our negotiations with the European Union, we should also strive for complete elimination of tariffs while tariff levels may already be low, the gains to be achieved from total elimination of tariffs would be significant as total goods trade alone between the U.S. and EU is over $1 trillion a year. And we also need a comprehensive agreement uh, in TTIP with no sectors excluded from coverage, including audiovisual and financial services. The agreement should also work towards regulatory coherence of financial regulations. I know that will about cover my first objective, and I think you all get the point. It's vital that our future trade agreements, we preserve, that we preserve fundamentals of U.S. trade and economic policy. So let's turn to objective number two, recognizing and addressing the opportunities and challenges our job creators and workers face doing business around the world. Now, the world has changed since the last Congress passed a TPA bill. The world of 200, 2015 is in many ways vastly different than the world of 2002. Let's start with digital trade. Here we have a complete revision of the 2002 law reflecting the increasing importance of digital trade to the U.S. economy and the central role the Internet plays as a platform in international commerce. In our bill, we included language to ensure that all trade agreement obligations relating to trade in goods and services apply equally to goods and services traded digitally. The bill also would have directed our negotiators to ensure that foreign governors do not impede cross-border data flows and refrain from instituting other impediments to digital trade. Finally, 
We specifically address the need for the U.S. government to pursue policies that eliminate forced localization requirements, including requirements for local storage or uh, processing of data. Although many of these issues are, are new, I fully expect agreements reached through the T, uh, uh, TPP and TTIP negotiations to reflect these priorities. Another increasingly difficult problem our companies face is unfair competition from state-owned enterprises. So the first time our TPA bill sought the elimination of trade distortions and unfair competition by state-owned enterprises and to ensure that they act based solely on commercial considerations. I want American businesses to be able to compete anywhere in the world, but we can't, we just can't expect our businesses to go head to head and win against state-owned enterprises that are protected from competition and market forces by their governments. That's why it is essential for TPP and future U.S. trade agreements to take this issue head on and to ensure that if foreign governments are going to maintain state-owned enterprises, those entities must act on a commercial basis. Our job creators and workers also need to have confidence that their hard work is not being unfairly harmed by currency manipulation. The Obama administration has done a very poor job here, that many members of Congress simply don't have confidence that this problem is being properly addressed. Frankly, I, under, I understand their frustration. That is why we included within our TPA bill for the first time a new principle negotiating objective uh, addressing currency manipulation. We need to see commitments from our partners in ongoing trade negotiations to avoid manipulating exchange rates to gain an unfair advantage over other, uh, other uh, parties to the agreement, a standard reflecting commitments parties have made to the International Monetary Fund. Now, it is essential that Congress know how the administration intends to address this problem in ongoing negotiations. Pretending that these concerns don't exist will not suffice. The administration must engage much more effectively with Congress on this issue if they want to receive strong support for TPA and any subsequent trade agreements. This brings us to the third major objective I have uh, in drafting our bill in 2014. And that is refinancing the relationship between Congress and the executive uh, uh, branch in trade negotiations. We've got to rebalance that uh, relationship. Of course, the first step here is, of course, to renew trade promotion authority. Our trade negotiators and trading partners need clear objectives from Congress. And the best way to communicate those objectives and give them force is TPA. I am perplexed by arguments some make that TPA gives away Congress's power. The reality is quite the opposite. TPA empowers Congress, expanding and enhancing its role in, a, in ongoing international trade negotiations. Now, I've just gone through a number of very specific policies that Congress should insist upon in our trade agreements from intellectual uh, property rights protection to protections against currency manipulation. The only way Congress can direct the administration to address these policies in their trade negotiations is through TPA. To, in developing the 2014 bill, I insisted upon including a number of new provisions that substantially enhance Congress's role without jeopardizing the ability of our country to negotiate and enact strong trade agreements. For example, the bill tightened the scope of qualifying implementi implementing bills to, quote, only such provisions as are strictly necessary or appropriate to implement, unquote, trade agreements. It provided that any commitments that are not disclosed to the Congress before an implementing bill is introduced are not to be considered part of the agreement or to have the force of law. We also included new provisions to ensure that agreements be concluded within the time frame provided by Congress and that substantial modifications or additions after that date 
are not eligible for approval under the trade authority's procedure, procedures, I guess, provided by TPA. The bill includes a number of new elements uh, to enhance consultation and oversight throughout the negotiating and implementation process. All in all, we crafted a very strong bill, building and improving upon decades of precedent found in prior TPA bills. Like I said, I believe the bill we introduced in the last Congress should be the starting point for our efforts to pass TPA this year. Now, the objectives that I've laid out today are every bit as relevant to my efforts to work with my colleagues to produce new legislation for this Congress. I'm very hopeful that we will be able to accommodate some of the issues raised by Ranking Member Wyden and get a new TPA bill introduced in just short order. Once it is achieved, I plan to move very quickly to get the bill out of the Finance Committee and out on the center, Senate floor for debate. Now, we've been without TPA, our most important tool to open markets, for far too long. And while we sit back, uh, other countries are forging ahead, cutting tariffs and other barriers for their exporters, hurting our ability to fairly compete and access the opportunities that may be out there. The U.S. needs to lead on trade. We need to establish rules that hold other nations accountable for their unfair trade practices. And we need to tear down barriers that block our goods from foreign markets. We can only do that if we renew TPA and do so soon. It's going to take a lot of work. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, it's going to take no small amount of bipartisanship from Capitol Hill all the way down to the White House to get this done. Now, with your help, your support, and others like you, I know we can be successful. I want to thank you once again, uh, and, and especially AEI, for having me here today. It's always a privilege for me to come here. And I want to thank you all for taking time to listen. I hope this opens the door a little bit to what's going on up there in Congress. God bless all of you. Thank you, Senator. Actually, we can work on the two podiums. Does that work for you? Sure, that'd be great. You want me to go over there? No, no. I'm used to this one. <laughs> Somewhat used to it. <laughs> Just so you know who the senator is. <laughs> <laughs> he does have great ambition. I <laughs> That's right. It's a great thing in Washington, D.C. Everybody really looks does. in the mirror and says, I wish I were Senator Hatch. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we, have a, we have some time for, for questions and answers here. And we're going to start here with AEI scholar Derek Scissors, and then we'll come up to you right here in the front. <laughs> Mike's coming to you, Derek. Uh, Sen Senator Hatch, thank you. I think I can hear you anyway. Senator Hatch, thank you for uh, your comments on substance. Uh, unfortunately, from due to some decisions made by the Obama administration, we also have a question of timing. Ah, That's there right. we go. That's right. um, you talked about introducing TPA as quickly as you could. You also know extremely well how difficult it might be. How do you see the timing for TPP working in here? Well, when should know, TPP come up and when we should we vote? But sorry about that. Thank as you. As you know, this, this administration has been doing basically nothing except for the trade representative. Our trade representative is one of the best I've seen. He's a very strong person, very bright guy. He's liberal, but he's good, <laughs> which is an exception sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's doing a very good job. But he's been held back by the administration. But I was very pleased to see the president calling for TPA in his State of the Union address. When he did that, that kind of said to everybody, we've got to move ahead. We've been pushing this now for years uh, in the Senate Finance Committee, and I think equally over in the House, although uh, Republicans uh, at, at part of that time were, were in the, uh, the minority, certainly in the Senate. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of time to do this. But I do believe that if the President really puts his full weight behind it, the trade ambassador is doing a good job, and he is very capable of explaining 
all of the ins and outs of the agreement that he's doing. And we can do it within the next month or two as far as getting TPA done. Then we'll go a long way towards uh, really passing trade legislation that will make a difference. TPA, you cannot, you cannot, in my opinion, conclude TPP or even TTIP without uh, TPA because uh, they're not going to put up with the possibility that every agreement they enter into is subject to amendment on two house floors. So that's why, that's why uh, TPA is, is so important. And uh, I was really pleased to see the president get behind it. I think that should be able to get us on the pathway to get this done. Mm. We are in, in real debates in the Senate Finance Committee right now, and I am working very strongly to, uh, to satisfy uh, Senator Wyden. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, we have to move forward no matter what, mm. in my opinion. Senator, you make a point that's important to us here at AEI. You know, we, we like to move good policy ideas beyond the realm of politics. It doesn't always happen, but you've been a tireless proponent of free trade for many years, and you just pointed out that a, a president of the opposite party, which has traditionally been unsympathetic to free trade, has now been persuaded by your point of view. Congratulations on this policy victory for I on behalf of wonderful. America. I'm not sure I had much to do with it. Well. <laughs> I give you the credit. Well, yes, I, sir. I have kept the pressure on. I'll put it. Back. <laughs> Senator Hatch's staff is telling us that we only have time for one more formal question. I'm sorry. And Carter Doherty from Bloomberg News has the floor. We have a mic coming to you, Carter. I can hear. Meantime, I'll speak loud. Uh, okay. Senator, uh, you mentioned state-owned enterprises, and uh, you know one of the other negotiations that's going on is the U.S.-China bilateral investment treaty. Right. Uh, and if I had to name a country where state-owned enterprises loom large it would be China. Yeah. Uh, is that an issue you'd like to see addressed in, in that agreement as well? And then quickly on the currency issue, you got a really sticky wicket to deal with here. You know, and in particular, this turns on the Treasury Department's longstanding reluctance to see anything about currencies and trade agreements. Is that an institutional hurdle you want to get over? Well, it is because it's not in our jurisdiction to really do that. Although there, there, I there is some currency manipulation language in the agreement according to our trade representative, but uh, uh, you know, I, I I forgot the first question was again. It was just, China. oh yeah, China. Why would I forget China? <laughs> I, th I think I have a tendency to block that out. <laughs> well, there's no use kidding. China is, uh, it can be uh, the greatest trading partner, and it's a huge trading partner with us right now. But in order to have it work well, they've got to live within constraints and certain laws, and just like we do. Uh, and we're going to live within them, and uh, we expect them to live within them. Uh, but that's easier said than done. Uh, it's crucial that we bring China into this orbit. It would be a major, major accomplishment, uh, but we're, I'm not sure we're, we're even close to doing that right now. Please join me on behalf of all of our friends here at AEI uh, and all of our friends here today in thanking Senator Hatch for his work and for joining us. Well, thank you so much.